what does God want? I was thinking about that, and I went back to the Garden of Eden, and in the Garden of Eden, he said, you can eat anything you want, you can have anything you want, everything's fair game, except here's a tree, and you can eat of anything else in the garden, but you can't eat of this tree, this tree is the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that's off limits. What did he want? In my opinion, he wanted obedience. He wanted him to just do what he said. Here's the limits, here's the limit, here's the freedom. He wanted obedience. Then I thought, okay, if you consider the entire Bible, or the Old Testament, the entire Old Testament. What's like one thing that stands out for you? What does he want us to do? Entire Old Testament. The Ten Commandments. He wants obedience. Does this make sense that God would want us to obey him? Okay. And then I thought about a place in the New Testament. And in the New Testament, Jesus is talking to some people who are following him. And he says this to them at one point. If any of you wants to be my followers, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily and follow me. Give up your own way, take up your cross daily and follow me. So stop doing it your way, start doing it my way. What does Jesus want? He says, I want you to obey me. Does this make sense? It just seems like that's what God wants. He wants us to obey him and and so I'm thinking about what I've been talking about the, for the last couple of weeks, which is the story of Jonah in the Old Testament scripture, right? Jonah was told by God, I want you to do something for me. What did God want Jonah to do? He wanted him to speak to the people in Nineveh so that they would hear his message. And the people of Nineveh were, were, were horrible people. Jonah disrespected them. They were just vile in every way, and he wanted them, frankly, to go to hell. And so he's like, I'm not going to go talk to them. So Jonah in the story, instead of obeying God, goes in the opposite direction. He gets in a boat headed in the opposite direction of Tarshish, but he's supposed to go to Nineveh. He was not obedient. So when I read a moment ago that Jesus said, you must give up your own way, Jonah did the opposite of that. Now, how does it feel when someone does the opposite of what you want? I've got a little video clip of two children arguing, contentious with each other, arguing about, of all things, the weather, not a more serious argument than many of those that we typically have. The weather, two children. Here we go. Oh 
What happened? She poked his heart. Okay. I think that's what happens when we disobey God. I think we poke his heart. I think we hurt him. He wants us to listen to him. He wants us to yield. He wants us to follow him. And when we don't, when we contest him and we resist, we poke his heart. So the last couple of weeks, for the last, I've done the same message. We'll go on to something different next week, but I've done the same message for three weeks in a row, and it's all about stubbornness. And I've asked you, week after week, are you stubborn? Yes. You want to go to the movies tonight? No. And you dig in your heels? Doesn't matter. I'm not talking about that kind of stubbornness. I'm talking about God wanting you to reconcile with someone or do something for someone or speak to someone about him or, or go somewhere and you he wants you to do it and you dig in your heels and you say no I've asked you how are you stubborn and why don't you go home and ask God what should I do about this and in some cases maybe God says whatever it doesn't matter or maybe in other cases he tells do, and you dig in your heels and you resist him. You say no. And when you say no to him, when God wants you to do something and you resist him, I think you poke his heart. Now, that's a funny term. We don't even know what it means. But what it means to me is what the boy did when his heart was poked. He he bent his head, tilted his head down. He was practically in tears. He was hurt by her. And I think that God is hurt by us on a deep level that I can't comprehend when we don't do what he wants. And that's what was happening in the Jonah story. Jonah did not do, did not, he didn't do what God wanted, and even more significantly, he didn't want to do what God wanted. He refused to do what wanted, God wanted. He was in disagreement with. The children were arguing about whether it was raining or what, drizzling, sprinkling. And then the, the boy seemed to say it was raining at one point. He was like getting a little confused. But the, Jonah didn't do what God wanted, and he didn't even want to do what God wanted, which was an even bigger problem. So what happens in the story, you remember, he, God said, go to Nineveh. He went in the opposite direction. Then God decides, okay, here's what we're going to do. To persuade him to do what I want him to do, God sent a storm on the water. It was a crazy storm. The boat was in danger of going down. The sailors are freaking out. They're running around. They're praying to all their respective gods. Help us, gods, whatever gods they worship. Somebody says, what about that dude that just joined us at a certain place? And they said, him? He's down the hole of the ship sleeping. And they go down. The captain goes down and says, wake up. We're about to go down. And, and who are you anyway? Jonah says, I am a follower of the living God who made heaven and earth and the sea that, and all that is in here. And I'm rebelling against God. I'm running in the opposite direction. The captain said, what are you thinking? We're going down. And the captain says, Jonah, what should, we, what should we do? What should we do? What should we do to prevent this from happening? And Jonah says, remember what he said? He says, there's really one solution. Throw me overboard and everything will be fine. Throw me overboard and it'll all be good. That's not true. There was not only one solution. There was more than one solution. What was the other solution? Turn around. As if Jonah had yielded to the desires of God, if he had yielded to God's wishes, if he had chosen to obey God, God would have also stopped the storm. There wasn't one solution, but there was one solution in Jonah's mind because he was in the hole of the ship coming, co pulling covers over his head because he didn't want to hear God. And he was determined that I'm not turning around and I'd rather be dead than do what God wanted. So just throw me overboard and you people will be fine. That was Jonah's position. And you know what? When we take a position, I'd rather be dead than do what you want me to do, God. We are poking the heart of God. And the sadness that we saw in the heart of that little boy in that video is the sadness of the heart of God. When we say, no, I'm not doing this, it pokes God. It hurts God. Jo that's what Jonah said. Forget it. I'm going to do what I want. I, I'm not doing what God wants. Just throw me overboard. That's what he said. And they did. And what happened? As soon as they threw Jonah out of that boat, whoosh, 
The waves stop. The wind stops. It's like it's all over and it's peaceful. And the, the sailors in that boat were blown away. It says the sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power. They was like, whoa, 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 whoa. They were awestruck by God's great power. They had never seen power like this displayed before. It was overwhelming to them. They were filled with awe. They were awestruck by God's great power, and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. They yielded to God. Well, God, you are amazing. It was like a miracle happening in your life, and you weren't sure what you really believed in God, but it was so overwhelming. It was like, I yield. I believe. And God was pleased with the sailors. Because their hearts were in tune with God. They, they loved God. They were awed by God and they loved God. They were devoted to God. God is pleaded with the sailors. When they threw Jonah overboard, storm stops, they're in awe of God and worship him. God was pleased. What happened to Jonah? We focus on the sailors. What happened to Jonah as soon as he was thrown overboard? You know what happened to him? I have a video of that. Check it out. Here it is. I, that's what I, I was thinking, how did that feel when Jonah was thrown out of that boat? This is how my mind works. This is, this is my mind, okay? I'm sitting there locked up in my room trying to think about this, and I'm thinking, what was that like for Jonah to be thrown out of that boat? And I was thinking, it's like, well, when, when I was a child, my family used to go to Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, when I was really young. And I remember, I remember jumping the waves and going out there, and, you know, I'm however tall, and, and the waves were like, as tall as this building, it seemed, relatively speaking. And I, I just, I still have a memory of those waves coming in and crashing. I remember one time I'm jumping the waves and I missed it. <laughs> and the, the boat, the wave rather, just took me and swirled me around like a rag doll. It was just nuts. I was just <laughs> head in the sand and all over the place. And I was like, wow, that was cool. Let's do it again. You know, it's like amazing. And, and I thought it's almost like that must have been the way it was for Joan. I was thinking, how do I illustrate this in the church? service. And at one point I was thinking, you know what I can do? I can pretend to be in a washing machine. I can get a group of people with wet towels throwing them at me and I can swirl around up front here. I was trying to illustrate it, but that's what it was like for Jonah. He's thrown overboard into this raging sea. And think about what happened to him. The, the way, just like, all of a sudden he banged up against the side of the boat, banged up again, banged up, thrown around, and then it's calm. That's what Jonah experienced. He experienced the very same thing just from below the water rather than the top of the water. He experienced the same thing that the sailors experienced. The sailors saw the waves crashing around above the surface of the water, and, and, and they're like, Phew. God calmed it down, and they're like, whoa. They fell on their knees. They worshiped God. It was like amazing. Jonah was thrown overboard below the surface of the water, and the waves were, Phew. and then it, Phew. same evidence. Same experience, just different perspective, but same experience. They, they experienced the storminess of the ocean and then calmness. And the response of the sailors above the surface of the water was to fall on their faces before God and worship him and commit to serving him. That was their response. But below the surface of the water, how did Jonah respond to the swirling of water and then the calmness? How did he respond? Now some of you think, well, he was, he was swallowed by a a whale, he was swallowed by a large fish. Forget the fish. Forget the fish. Don't even think about the fish. Think about the, how did Jonah respond to the same thing that, that, that the sailors experienced? Experience, experience the waves and the power of God calming it. Jonah experienced the waves and the power of God calming it. How did he respond to the power of God calming the waves of the water? How did he respond? What did he do? What did he do? He did nothing. He did nothing. He wasn't moved. It didn't affect him. God displayed his power. He displayed the same power for Jonah that he displayed for the sailors. The sailors fell on their faces before God and worshipped God. Jonah's like, he doesn't have anything to do with God. Did nothing. Did nothing. Now he's swallowed by a fish. Fine. He's swallowed by a fish. And, and, and for three days, he's not moved. And like nothing changes in his spirit. Nothing changes in his heart. Those two children are arguing. 
punning at each other, you know, it's raining or no, it's spritzing, sprinkling, whatever. And Jonah's heart is not moved. He's persisting in his adamant refusal to yield to God for three days. It's, it's just how it's going. And then finally, after three days, this is what happens. This is, he, he, he says, as my life was slipping away, what does that mean? As my life was slipping away, what's happening to him? He's dying. And he knows he's dying. He is close to finished. As his life is slipping away, I remembered the Lord. And my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. He finally prayed to God and he said, okay, I'll go to Nineveh. That's what happened. Now, question, anybody here, a parent, if you are a parent have you, and you have more than one child, have you ever had a fight between your children? Has you, have your children ever fought? Anybody here ever have children have fought with each other? See, now we have three children. They have never in their entire life fought. It's amazing. So I'm just talking entirely theoretically now, but they never fought. But I'm assuming your, your kids probably have. So when your kids fight with the, these boys down here, they, have they ever fought? Yes, I thought so. Like, when they fought, what do you do as a parent? They're being jerks, your children are being jerks, and you lose your mind and you say, now what? You say to your children. Now you be you need to apologize to your sister or to your brother. Have you, anybody ever said that? You need to say you're sorry. Anybody here ever say that to your kid? Right? You need to say you're sorry. And how do they say it? Sorry, you jerk. <laughs> and you say, great, that's just what I wanted. Now we're one big happy family. Is that what you say? No, you say, do it again. Mean it. I'm sorry. And then finally, third or fourth or eighth try, sorry. And you say, that's all the better it's going to get. <laughs> it's still not, right? It's still not what you want. It's still not what you want. But it's like, hey, at least we're headed in the right direction. You know, it's, it's better than what it was before. And that's where Jonah is. John is close to death, and he's like facing reality, either I'm dead or not, and he says, fine, I'll talk to the idiots in Nineveh. I hope you're happy. That's how the story is. That's what happened. That's how the story And God says, okay, we're making progress. Back it up. What does God want? He wants obedience, right? That's what he wants. Well, what do you want? Jonah's obeying. He should be happy, right? Is, is all that God wants obedience? I'm not sure. So anyway, Jonah says, fine, I'll go talk to the people of Nineveh. I hope you're happy. And then it says this. It says, then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out onto the beach. And then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go into the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given to you. And he agrees. And he goes. And for, it's interesting to me, for three days he preaches to them. He's in the belly of fish for three days, and he's preaching them for three days. His message basically is this. You've been rotten scumbags of a group of people, and you're going to hell. Forty days from now, God's going to wipe this place out. You look at the scripture, that's basically the message in the third chapter of Jonah. You're going to be destroyed in 30 days. That's what Jonah delivered. And he probably took pleasure in saying it, too. But what happened? Do you know what happened? The Spirit of God moved them. And they responded. And they put on sackcloth. And they covered themselves in ashes, which doesn't mean anything to us. But there was like a, a spirit of repentance that went through the community. And it was like an awakening. They were like awakened to the fact that they had been royally horrible people collectively and there was a, a season of repentance that broke out and it was authentic it was real it was heartfelt and guess what happened god changed his mind he was going to wipe him out jonah was right He was going to wipe him out in 40 days he was going to wipe him off the planet but they heartfelt responded and and repented and god changed his mind and said you know what I'll forgive you. I'll forgive you. Wonderful God. Wonderful God. 
Check the heart of God out. He's, he's a loving God. Now watch this, chapter 4, Jonah. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah. And he became very angry. He started putting his fists through the walls. He was furious. This is just what I expected you to do. Now, I just made those words up. It's pretty much accurate. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? This is why I ran away to Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you're a merciful and compassionate God. So, aren't you glad God is merciful and compassionate? But Jonah's mad about that. These are not qualities he wants. Why? Because he wants those people to get what they have coming to them. Anybody here ever want that to happen? Or is Jonah the only one that's revengeful here? Okay. So Jonah's, ah, come on, God. You're the part of bring it home here. You can make justice happen here. That's why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew you're a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. Makes me sick to the stomach. You're eager to turn back from destroying people who deserve it, I might add. Just kill me now. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. See, right there it is. He'd rather be dead. What did he just do? Poke the heart of God. I'd rather be dead than have this happen, than to have you be forgiving and merciful and compassionate. I'd rather be dead, God. And he poked in the heart of God, and God's like hurt by that. See, God doesn't want obedience. God wants obedience aligned, combined with an alignment of our hearts to his heart. He doesn't merely want obedience. He wants shared hearts with his heart. That's what he wants. And he wasn't getting it from Jonah. So Jonah said, just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. So he's still holding that hope. Still holding, hope, still holding out hope that maybe God will. Maybe God will still nail him at the end. He's still throw, holding on to that. What does God want? Well, again, in the scripture, we read uh, that, that God wants, wants uh, obedience, like Jesus said one time, Lord, if you love me, he said, obey my commandments. So he wants obedience. But he also says this. We also read this in, in 1 John. It says, it says, if somebody says, I love God, but hates his fellow believer, that person's a liar. For we don't. For if we don't love people that we can see, how can we love God who we cannot see? He wants our hearts to be merged to his heart. So what's, what's Jonah doing? He is just furious. He's fit to be tied. And his attitude is, there, I did what you want. Are you happy, God? Are you happy, God? That's his mentality, right? Are you happy? He's just fit to be tired. He's furious. He steams, smart, smoke's coming out of his ears. And he goes... He goes to the east of the city. Listen to this. It says this. It says, Then Jonah went out to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit in as he waited to see what would happen to the city. Do you notice what he's doing? He's going to the east side of the city. And he's sitting down, making a shelter of some sort. At... Now, what does it mean to make a shelter? Here's, here's what it means. It means he tailgated, okay? He went up to a, vantage, a, a, a higher elevation vantage point and he tailgated looking over the city. And what was he waiting to see happen? Have you ever seen, gone anywhere to see fireworks? And you want to get a good vantage point to see those fireworks? That's what Jonah was doing. He was going to a good vantage point. He was tailgating, waiting for the fireworks to happen. And the fireworks were going to come from the heavens and they were going to fry those people. That's what he wanted to see. That's why he's in East of the city. That's why, he's, that's why he's tailgating. He's tailgating to see God just nail these people. He's just waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for that to happen. Smoke's coming out of his ears. He's just waiting. And what happens? What happens in this story? Well, he's sitting there, and it's stinking hot. Have you ever experienced stinking hot conditions? He's sweating like a pig. Like I was on my vacation, I was building the deck and building this sidewalk with pavers, and I was sweating like a pig doing all this stuff, right? Stinking hot. It's stinking hot. All he wants to do is see fireworks. 
stinking hot. And then all of a sudden this tree grows up with leaves, big leafy branches stuff. And it's like the, the temperature now with this plant over jo, Jonah is like 20 degrees less. It's so refreshing. It's just, it's just great. And Jonah's like, well, at least you threw me a bone here. At least you threw me a bone. So he's, he's much happier now that he's underneath this plant. And God, God gave him this plant. He's, he's still waiting for the fireworks to happen. And then it gets later and later, and it's time to fall asleep. And Jonah starts curling up, and he's going to sleep. And overnight, the same God who sent the storm and sent the plant, and sent Jonah, for that matter, to speak to Peter, that same God sent a worm. And the worm came and came, started chewing on the stem, the main stem of the plant. And the plant croaked. <laughs> And the next day, the sun came up. The plant was dawn, dead. It was shriveled up. It wasn't producing the shade. And Jonah's like, oh, well, it's okay. But then it got hotter and hotter. And the same God that caused the storm and all this other stuff, he caused a hot wind to blow and the sun to burn down in him. And Jonah was kicking things. He was just furious. He was really mad now. He's really mad at God. And, 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 and he began to curse God. Like, God, what is up with this? Now you took away my plant. Can't you do anything right for me, God? Why are you so nice to them and not nice to me? And then, this, then the Lord, the story ends right here. Check this out. God speaks to Jonah. This is how the whole story of Jonah ends. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, although you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly, and it died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? What's God saying to him? He's saying, don't you get it? Jonah, there's 120,000 human beings that I have created that I love. You love this plant, I love them. Don't you understand that as you grieve over the death of this plant, I grieve over these people? What does God want Jonah to do? He wants Jonah to obey him, and he wants Jonah to share his heart. He wants him to share the same heart that God has for these people. He wants that. So what happens to Jonah? Does Jonah's heart change? What happens to Jonah? Do you know? You don't know. Nothing more in the Bible about Jonah. Never. You don't know. You don't know. Did Jonah now change his heart? Did Jonah go on and do more and more of what God wanted with the right heart all along? We don't know. You know this is a more important question than what happened to Jonah. You know what the more important question is? What's going to happen to you? How are you going to respond? Because here's the deal. I've been talking about this for three weeks. Our stubborn hearts. And the message is the same. Just tweaked. But it's all the same. It's like... Is there an area of your life where you're stubborn? Let the Holy Spirit speak to you and tell you about that. And now go to the Holy Spirit. Go to the Lord and say, God, do you want me to do anything about the area of stubbornness? And some of you, these last couple of weeks, have known about an area of stubbornness. And some of you have either prayed and asked God, and God said, this is what I want you to do, and you haven't done it. Or you haven't prayed and asked God because you already knew what God wanted you to do, and you just... Dig in your heels, and you're stubborn. I just want you to know how God feels about that. When you know what God wants you to do, and you know your heart is not in alignment with him, and you dig in your heels, you know what you're doing? You're poking the heart of God. And you're causing pain and disappointment. Because God wants you to obey, and he wants you to have his heart. And some of you have heard this and you've fought it for two weeks now. And you're resistant to whatever God is telling you to do. And you have all your reasons why. And God wants one thing. He wants you to obey him and have his heart. There was a person that talked to me this week. Maybe this has happened to you already. A person talked to me this week and said that they were sitting here in the church last Sunday. I think it was last Sunday. Probably possibly both weeks, but certainly last Sunday. And they were listening to me. And, and they thought of a family member with whom they had had some, with whom there was some estrangement. Anybody have any estrangement in your family system? Like, yeah, okay. And this individual 
knew of the of estrangement in this individual's spouse's family. So they're hearing me. Have you ever done this? I'm preaching, and the person starts nudging their spouse. This is for you. This one's for you. You got to do something about this. That's what they were doing. That's what they were thinking. Have you ever done that? Yeah, we've all done that. And then the Holy Spirit said to the person in this church this past week, this past week, the, person, the Holy Spirit said, no, this is for you. But the individual's not even my blood relative. The Holy Spirit said, this is for you. So you know what the person did? What the person did? They arranged a meeting with that person with whom there had been an estrangement. They got together this past week, and there was a massive healing. Now, how does God feel about that? How does God feel about that, people? Is he happy? I think he's happy. See, that's the opposite of nudging his heart. That's pleasing him. He's happy. Some of us are stubborn in this room. You've heard from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants you to do something. You know what it is. And it doesn't have to be reconciliation. It could go in a different direction. It could be that the Holy Spirit wants you to do something for him. The Holy Spirit might want you to speak to somebody about Jesus the way God wanted Nineveh to, uh, Jonah to speak to the people in Nineveh. Or maybe the Holy Spirit wants you to whatever it is. It doesn't just have to be about reconciliation. But the Holy Spirit wants you to. And you're saying, no, 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 no. And you're poking the heart of God. What do you need to do? What do you, what do you need to do? You've uh, been told by God. You're stubborn. You've been told by God. You need to do something about that stubbornness, about your coworker, or your neighbor, or your whatever, your child, or your parent, or whatever it is. What do you need to do? Where's the place to start? Here's where it is. First thing you do, you need to confess your sin. Now just think how that would fly if I told Jonah that. Jonah, you need to confess your sin. He's just been spit up by the fish on the, the beach. You need to confess my sin, Jonah would say. My sin. My sin? Let me tell you about sin. Jonah, go off on the people in Nineveh. No, no, no. And you will go off on, with me over this person that's an offense to you if that's the application in your life. No, 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 no. I'm telling you. No, it's not about their sin. It's about your sin and your sin of stubbornness, which pokes the heart of God. You need to confess that. You've not been obedient, and your heart isn't right. True or false? It's true. You need to confess that. And you need to pursue the heart of God. Now, you might say, well, that's an interesting idea. What's, what's exactly the heart of God? I don't know what the heart of God is, but here's what the Lord gave me as an idea of a description of the heart of God. I'm taking the scripture and I'm applying it in this setting. Here's what I think the heart of God is, my opinion. It says this in Galatians. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our, heart, in our lives. Love. Does this sound like the heart of God? Love. Joy. Peace. Patience. Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. Gentleness and self-control. Is, is that the heart of God? What do you think? I think that's the heart of God. So here's what you need to do. You're stubbornly resisting. You're stu still stubbornly resisting. Here's what you need to do. Number one, you need to confess. You confess your lack of obedience and you confess your heart. That's the first thing. Lord, I am sorry. And then you pray. You begin to pray every day. Lord, give me your heart. If, if it's in relationship, I'm, trying, I'm talking often about people. It could be something else. But if it is, I can't stand my neighbor... Lord, help me to love my neighbor. That's the first word. Love my neighbor. Help me love my neighbor. Help me love him. I can't stand him. Help me love him, Lord. Help me love him. Joy. Help me have joy for my neighbor when my neighbor has something go well for him or her. Love, joy, peace. Give me peace. When I think about my neighbor, help me not to get stirred up about my neighbor. Help me have peace. 
Help me a peace about the idea of what you want me to do and the timing of that. Help me a peace. Love, joy, peace, patience. Give me patience with that person. Patience, Lord, I can't stand them. I can't stand what they've done. I can't stand the thought of them. Give me patience. Give me joy. Give me peace. Give me self-control so I don't mouth off to them the way I sometimes can mouth off. Give me this stuff. Give me kindness. Help me to be kind to this person. Help me to be good to this person. Help me to be the kind of person I want to be in your sight. Help me to be that way around. Give me your heart, God. If you've been stubbornly resisting me for the past couple, not me, if you've been stubbornly resisting the Lord the past couple of weeks and doing what he has wanted you to do, two things. One, confess that. Confess your disobedience. Confess your heart. And then two, pray for his heart to transform you. Pray for him to help you be loving and kind and patient and peaceful and joyful and self-control. Help him. Help me to be more like you want me to be. That's what you should do. That's, that's what you need to do. And I believe, I believe God's going to answer that prayer. I think he's going to change your heart. There's an interesting scripture. I never thought about it before relative to Jonah, but I've read this interesting scripture, very well known, read, read often at weddings. Here's what it says. And I'm going to translate it into Jonah's life. If Jonah could speak the languages of earth and of angels but didn't love others, he would be a noisy, only a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. Like if he, he was a prophet. He did some speaking in his time. If he could speak eloquently as a prophet in an amazing kind of way, but had no love in his heart, God would not be impressed with his ability to be a good prophet. Because he's wanting the love of God in his own heart. He's wanting Jonah's heart to be aligned with his. It goes on, it says, if I had the gift of prophecy, that's Jonah's gift. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all God's plans, secret plans, and possessed all knowledge, if I had all the faith needed to move mountains, but I did love others, I'd be nothing. You know what? You're nothing without God's heart. If, if, if you don't yield your heart, all the good stuff you do, but I did this, and I did that, and I did this, and I did that, you know what? It doesn't count. You need to have God's heart. Obedience alone is not enough. We need to move in the direction of God's heart. And none of us are ever going to be perfect, okay? We all fail. I, I fail. You fail. We all fail. But this is the direction we need to be headed in. So I'm going back to the question I've been playing with the last couple of weeks, and that is this. Are you stubborn in an area, any area of your life? And what does God have to say about that stubbornness? This is between you and the Lord. It's, between, it's not, none of my business. I'm not telling you what to do. This is the Holy Spirit telling you what to do. But if there's stubbornness in your life, and the Holy Spirit wants you to do something about it, I challenge you to confess that negative attitude that you have. I challenge you to pray for his heart. And I challenge you, with the heart of God, to act as he wants you to act. Let me pray. Lord, I, I ask that you would help us to have your heart, everybody here, to have your heart. And I, I pray that you would just come over us by your Holy Spirit and change us. Help us to be changed. Help us to be more like your son, Jesus. I know, the, the pushback in this is, but the other person's really stubborn, and even if I make overtures to them, they're not going to respond. And, you know, maybe the people in Nineveh wouldn't have responded to Jonah. He still did what he needed to do. The response is really up to the Lord. Help us to do our part, and um, help us to do the, break down our stubbornness, to have your heart, and we just pray that you would do the work. Some of us are really scared to do whatever you're calling them to do. Some of us are just really scared. We're afraid for a variety of reasons. I don't know what all the reasons might be, but we're scared. I pray that you would help us to step out. I thank you so much for the individual in our church that did reach out to the person that was not their blood relative, but that person in the family system reach out. And I thank you so much. You gave them a good outcome, a good blessing, a good reunion. I pray that that relationship would flourish. I pray that that would happen for more of us this week. I know it doesn't always. But I pray that you would help us, at the very least, to be obedient. As Jason Rutt said, I referenced him the last couple of weeks, if you're moved, you move. 
I think that's almost like if you're moved by the heart of God, you move in alignment with the heart of God. If anybody here is moved by your Holy Spirit, I pray that it would move and obey you with your heart. In your name we pray, amen.